folks, hello. Uh, Chris and I in this episode of uh, Let's Talk Ed are on a rant beginning of 2024. We thought, you know, we'd, uh, we'd give ourselves a, a holiday gift of allowing ourselves to uh, meander. We're talking about the future of colleges. We're talking about the cost. We're talking about the impact on the taxpayers through the increase in cost and uh, for financial aid. And we're talking about uh, the increase in tuition fees and whatnot. And now in this third segment, we're going to be talking about potentially how to fix the problem because of its impact on our society, on our students, of course, on innovation, on, on employment and what have you. Chris, we haven't addressed it, but there's something that before we went on the air seemed to irk you quite a bit. And I want you to talk about that bird that's been, uh, you know, uh, in your side kind of deal. Yeah. So so that is endowments. And it's something that many colleges like to brag on the size of their endowment. Uh, and, and in some cases, they're incentivized not to do much with those endowments other than grow them, uh, because there are some rankings out there that, uh, you get, you get points based on the size of your endowment. And to me, I've always seen that as a waste of money. I, I understand the importance of having that rainy day fund. I understand that sometimes you get money that is earmarked for, you know, a specific thing or something like that. But to have money just sitting in the bank, not doing anything other than collecting interest irritates me. Uh, we, we've seen colleges that have areas that are in desperate need of repair, desperate need of sprucing up. Uh, but more importantly for students, what I see is the opportunity to invest the money in your students. So I won't name the, the particular college, but uh, there, there is a college that has an endowment large enough that they could send all of their students through for something like 10 to 15 years without any student paying one cent to go there. Uh, and this is a very prominent, uh, well-respected university. And like to me, that that just that is absolutely a burr under my saddle because you know, let's do things to help our students. The, the student debt issue that, that we've talked about uh, a little bit in our last episode and we've talked about a little bit more on the show, it's a problem that's not going to go away. Um, you know, there's not going to be something magical that wipes out all of our student debt. Uh, I know there are some people that are, are hoping for that. I know there are some people that have had their debt uh, wiped away. But the reality is when you have high student debt, it can be very limited. Uh, it can be very limiting rather for what you are going to do in life. And if you could reinvest that in students, whether that is lowering tuition or giving more institutional scholarships or institutional aid of some sort or lowering your fees or something like that, I think that would be a huge game changer for students. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at things a little bit different. I understand what you're talking about. I'm I'm thinking about it from the perspective of a couple of perspectives. And maybe you disagree with me, but I'm going to say I'm going to want to hear your thoughts. You know, while we're students, we want, you know, the best educational facility, the best technology, the best teacher, uh, most developed skills of the teacher and, and whatnot. But is it true that when we graduate, we're interested in the fanciest building and the nicest football stadium or, or basketball arena or hockey arena? I don't know. But it seems it seems that that's what they keep on telling us. That's why we keep on investing in those. Another element that I keep on thinking about is, you know, 
the massive universities originally were the land grant universities because it was agriculture, because uh, vet science, genetics, biochemistry, and all of those required a large number of people. More and more, those same institutions and many more are chasing biomedical, medicine, and, and more theoretical uh, sciences. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just, I'm not judging it. I'm just wondering out loud how that impacts the society when they're saying you've got money sitting in a bank and that you're earning so much on it. You're not helping your students. Your tuition keeps on going up. Your fees keep on going up. You're not paying your faculty as well as you could. You're not developing them as well as you should. And at the same time, you're investing in the fancy and nice looking things that get used very little. What do you think about that? Does that, does addressing that help fix the problem or am I just high on something? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, it's tough because you, you hear with athletics in particular, um, the, the amount of alumni dollars that athletics can, can bring in and, when you win, you tend to bring in more money. Uh, and, and some of that has been very demonstrable. You look at the NCAA tournament, and when you have a team uh, that makes a surprise run, you often hear the story that all of a sudden they got millions of dollars more in donations from alumni that are now really excited about things. Uh, but the reality is we we need it all, right? We we need all of these things. And, you know, we need to be taking care of our students, whether they are, you know, going to be a literature major or an English major, or, you know, they are going into a STEM field or going into medicine or, or whatever. You know, we, we need to find a way to do all that. But we also need to do that in a way where we are very good stewards of our dollars. and. You know, that's something, you know, especially when you're talking about, you know, your, your public universities uh, that, you know, are, are seeing taxpayer dollars come through there in some way, shape or form. And we want to see them be very good stewards of that money, um, because in, in our personal lives, we're probably not just going and, and spending like crazy. And some universities, and you, you see this at the end of the budget year often, where uh, you're incentivized to spend the entirety of your budget uh, because you know if you don't, you won't get as much next year. Uh, so sometimes at the end of that budget year, you, you see people that are spending wildly and, and getting the nice to have things or stocking up on on something instead of just sitting back with that money. Another element that, that, you know, we addressed in the prior two segments is that meritocratic idea of, you know, you, you go to school, you work hard, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you get a good job, you send your kids to a good school and so on. Uh, two very prominent philosophers in, 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 and thinkers, uh, um, Michael Sandel and, and Daniel Markowitz, have addressed the issue of, of uh, that meritocracy and how poisonous it is on our society. And I'm wondering, is part of the solution Stick in a dynamite stick in that idea, meritocratic idea, and going back to the empowerment of every Tom, Dick, and Harry, Jane, uh, Mary, and, and Sally. Because at the end of the day, how does it help us when we have quotas of African American, quotas of women, quotas of, of, uh, of Latinos, quotas of, of Asians? that we have to accept just because we want to look good as opposed to helping be part of a systemic change in those communities that deserve us, that have contributed, 
even for a private and even for a private for profit institution, through their tax dollars, have contributed to those institutions. Do you think that this rant is has value? Do you think it could be part of a solution? I, you know, it, it's interesting because you, you talk about like DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, inclusion, and uh, some of the, the things that you just mentioned come out of that. And, and you're seeing those come under attack a lot now. And, you know, it, it's one of those that in some areas, if you're in a small rural community, trying to achieve some of those goals is probably going to be very hard because your population base doesn't include those. I, I live in a community that, uh, you know, the county's population is more than 90 percent Caucasian. So trying to bring in a lot of minorities is difficult because they simply aren't here. And being in a community college, you are really recruiting from your own backyard. So trying to achieve that is very, very difficult. Um, I think there's merit to doing that. But there are also, you know, potential concerns with doing that. And we've seen court cases come out about quotas and, and all of that. So, uh, you know, and, and ultimately... Is that the best way to handle all of those things? I don't know. And, and I don't claim to know. And of course, we want to try to, to help. We want to try to be part of the solution. But is this really how we lift our society at a time when we are reeling from a decrease in innovation, from a decrease in our ability to to keep being that beacon and that, you know, having the corner uh, on the market of, of the next big thing, right? You, you can't have it both ways. You, you can't talk about this and not be part of a solution is how I'm seeing it. And you can't solely rely on, you know, flying your plane all over the world and hiring whoever and bringing them to your institution or shipping your manufacturing or your design to where those hubs are. Yeah. So I think to, to close us out, too, and bring us kind of back on how we might fix this this cost of education, too. One of the things that we haven't addressed, uh, and I think it's kind of the elephant in the room, is should colleges be looking at a way to lower tuition, to lower fees, books and all of that? And we, we've had conversations about textbooks before. And yes. Uh, there are options out there, but, uh, you know, all of these things, is that something that's going to make a college more attractive to somebody or more accessible to somebody? So, you know, I think that's one of those things. And, and there are some colleges that, that have tried that. Um, you know, it's still a, a limited number in the grand scheme of things. And, uh, I, I think that is something that could definitely help. Uh, yes. And, and I think to, to further what you said, I think rather than uh, choosing the approach of the arms race, you know, an escalation, why don't we go back to the drawing board and really recost everything that we do? We have a vested interest when we own the bookstore or when we partner with the bookstore company and we get kickback from the sale of textbooks and, and merchandise, right? So we have a vested interest in keeping that flow of money, right? But is that the right way to do it on behalf of our taxpayers, on behalf of our students, on behalf of our communities, and so on? You know, an arms race versus really going back and redesigning and reconfiguring. So we've been talking about... Uh how we fix the high cost of, of colleges. And uh, we've talked about what that does to society, what that does to our students and all of that. If you enjoy rants like this, uh, you can subscribe to us here on YouTube, ring that bell down below, and you'll be notified when we post new content. 
And of course, you can find Let's Talk Ed on all of your favorite podcasting platforms as well. So for Dr. Zahi Atala, I'm Chris Ford. We'll see you next time right here on Let's Talk Ed.